subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go hello and welcome to today's dns session we are going to have a discussion on today's newspaper the hindu delhi edition dated 22nd april 2022 we shall pick up only those articles important from the perspective of civil service examination and discuss them as per the demand of the exam before we begin with the discussion i would just like to inform you that the environment ecology and biodiversity compass is out in the market in the description section you will find the amazon link to this compass this is the lead article from today's newspaper in this article dr manmohan singh has talked about various ideas one of the idea and the concept that he has discussed in the article is that of a global village he has discussed the idea whether economic integration is effective enough to prevent wars or in general conflicts dr manmohan singh has said that the russia ukraine conflict has warned the reshaping of the world order how because ever since the berlin war fell in 1989 there was a paradigm shift in global societies, frictionless borders and open economies became order in many nations. And this catalyzed the freer movement of people, goods, services and capital across the world. The fruits were visible immediately. The global trade and per capita GDP nearly doubled in the next two decades, marking an era of general peace and prosperity. So societies and economies got intertwined in the pursuit of shared global prosperity. Such tight interdependence among nations will lead to fewer conflicts and promote peace. This became the established wisdom. But the Russian-Ukraine conflict has dismantled this wisdom. If interconnectedness and trade among nations were mutually beneficial, then it implies that its disruption and blockade will be mutually harmful. So the retaliatory economic sanctions imposed on Russia would have hurt all nations, although some more and some less. It is a fact today that the sanctions are hurting nations like Egyptians are reeling for food shortages due to their dependence on Russian and Ukrainian wheat. Germans suffer from high cost of heating due to their dependence on Russian gas. Americans face a shortage of electric cars due to unavailability of car batteries that are dependent on Russian nickel. Sri Lankans have taken to the streets on economic woes and Indian farmers run the risk of high fertilizer price triggered by global shortage. So the interconnectedness of societies and economies are visible but still the nation went for war. So here in the article Dr. Manmohan Singh questions the liberal idea of global village. The wisdom that economic interconnectedness or dependence prevents conflict and wars. This idea is not new and many philosophers and liberal thinkers have given reasoning for this. Immanuel Kant, it goes back to the time of Rousseau. Even John Stuart Mill has given a detailed analysis of this idea. He writes in the principles of political economy, the great extent and rapid increase of international trade in being the principal guarantee of the peace of the world is the great permanent security for the uninterrupted progress of ideas, the institutions and the character of the human race. It is the principal guarantee of peace of the world. But this is not a very simple idea. Just to say that economic integration, interdependence or interconnectedness prevents conflict and wars is very, very simplistic. And there are many underlying assumptions when one say this. First and foremost, Trade benefits the states in a manner that decision makers value it. Just to give you an example, if country A is trading with country B and importing consumer goods, goods for mass consumption, then decision makers are definitely going to value it more than some specialized equipment or even some very high-end technology. Wheat could be a much more stronger issue than choppers. So it is not just trade. The nature of the trade and the way the policy makers, the decision makers look at it, the importance of it politically is also very important. There are other assumptions in this idea that conflict will reduce or completely cut off trade. But we have seen and I'll give you in very short while some detailed examples as to during World War I and World War II it didn't happen. Even when countries were fiercely going against each other in war, trade in critical equipments still used to happen between the two nations. 
It's also very important that the decision makers will take these two observations into account before choosing to go for war. If you have a dictator with mean self-interest, then the benefit that the trade brings to the nation will be discounted. Practically, it is seen that it is not just the trade. There are many other variables that one has to see in order to judge the situation as to what are the chances or the probability for the nations to go for war or escalating the conflict. See, asymmetry in trade can increase the chances of conflict if the trade is more important to one state than the other. Meaning if the trade is skewed, then the partner in the trade getting lesser benefit will have lesser resolve to maintain peace. It will have more incentive or will be more willing to go for war or, or to escalate the conflict. One of the examples is China and Japan. China thinks that Japan needs China more than China needs Japan. And this has led to China becoming more assertive in the case of Senkaku Island dispute. But you see, the trade is always asymmetrical. It is not a 50-50% case. But it is the radical asymmetry that makes the global situation more vulnerable. This radical asymmetry is not there in the case of China and Japan. The radical asymmetry is also not there in the case of China and US. But the radical asymmetry exists in case of China and India. The trade deficit of India and Indochina trade is very high. And you see what China does, it doesn't shy away in escalating the tension at the border. There is another factor that if the government of the two nations are so professional, if the industries are so professional, if the finances and economics is the core driving force that they have continued trade during war, then there will be no problem in escalating the tension at the border or even, rage, or even waging wars. For example, during the Anglo-Dutch war, British insurance companies continued to insure enemy ships and paid to replace the ships that were being destroyed by their own army. Even during World War II, there were numerous examples of American firms continuing to trade strategic goods with Nazi government. So these examples suggest that the outbreak of war does not radically reduce trade between enemies and sometimes when it does, it often quickly returns to pre-war level after the war has concluded. So in such scenario, the economic interdependence, the trade, the bilateral or the regional trade has very little role or influence in maintaining the peace. In many cases, it is also the expectation of future trade which is the deciding factor rather than the present economic order, the present financial or economic interconnectedness or dependence. If a highly dependent state expects future trade to be high, decision makers will behave liberally and treat war as less appealing option. However, if there are no expectations of future trade, then a highly dependent state will attach low value to continue the peaceful relation and war could seem more enticing. For example, despite high level of trade in 1914, German leaders believed that the rival trade powers would attempt to undermine this trade in the future. So the war to secure control over raw minerals was in the interest of Germany long-term security. In the idea of economic interdependence, ushering one also has to consider the nature of the power of the state. If a status quo power has a strong economic type, for example, United States or UK or France, with a revisionist state, revisionist states are those whose economic might or the status of power or superpower globally is in transition. These revisionist states have lesser influence of the pressure groups. They are more authoritarian. They will be working under fewer constraints and will be able to take easily more aggressive stance. This revisionist state in the 21st century is China. They are taking aggressive stance against a major economic partner, Japan. Then another very, very crucial factor is the provocative effect that the relation is having on the strategic interest of the nation. There could be a situation of unbearable strategic vulnerability. For example, the Crimean annexation of Russia came from this feeling of extreme strategic vulnerability. The US or the Western influence, if that came to the Eastern Europe, that was too much to bear for Russia. Ukraine joining NATO, that was too much to bear for Russia. Now, in that scenario, the economic relation of Russia and Ukraine will not work. If you take another example of US and China, 
they have many opposing strategic interests but neither is in a strategically vulnerable position because they do not share land borders that is why us didn't look at china as a villain for a very very long time but the same is not true for the case of russia because china did not used to pose the same level of threat the same level of strategic vulnerability to us as the tsarist of russia did to imperial germany back then and also the tension between china and japan or between china and us does not come to the level of national survival so it is less likely that china and us will go for a war if you have read world history it is often said that nobody knew the exact reason for outbreak of world war 1 and nobody was actually prepared for it everyone was posturing and posing hoping that situation will not escalate but nevertheless it did that essentially was because of lack of effective communication if the relation between nations even go to the worst but there are good communication channels diplomatic channels backed through third party mediators some backdoor communications these channels help allay the situation of a war for example india and pakistan we have seen the lowest ebb of the relation between two countries but the communication channel nevertheless between the two nation is pretty strong and we have successfully averted a highly tense situation several times so yes trade does seem to reduce the likelihood of conflict but should not be seen as a deterministic factor as a strategic interest vulnerabilities and other factors have larger role to play there is no hard rule as to what will be the driving factor as the nature of economic interdependence and that of strategic factors impact their relative values this is the editorial article from page number 8 growing ambition whose ambition china's ambition china is about to get into a security pact with solomon island it's the first of its kind china is getting into this kind of pact with a first pacific island nation but in all likelihood this is not going to be the last the ambition is ever growing this map depicts the geographical location of solomon islands it's a group of around six large islands it lies between papua new guinea and vanuatu island solomon island is in the malanesia group of islands you have bismarck archipelago new guinea new caledonia fiji vanuatu santa cruz these are in the malanesia group of islands in the micronesia group of islands and you should know the name there is very there is one very important island kiribati island solomon island and kiribati island these two have come under the influence of china marshall island caroline island mariana island palau these are in the influence of us although we do not know very well the exact terms of the pact between china and the solomon island but according to the leaked media report the draft agreement paves the way for china to deploy its security forces there solomon island can request police and military personnel from china to assist in maintaining social order and china can make ship visits and use the ports of solomon island for logistics this will give chinese vessel a strategic foothold look at the area it is in it is very close to australia and guam where us has naval base china presently is already exerting itself all over the world it has its flagship program of belt and road initiative it is already showing aggression in south china sea and on top of this an agreement with the solomon island is seen as much increased strategic depth of china in the area if we have to look at the reasons as to why china is showing so much interest in the solomon island there are many there are plenty of reasons first there is a taiwan factor the pacific islands are among a few region in the world where china has competition from taiwan for diplomatic recognition taiwan is trying very hard for independent smaller nations in the region to recognize its independence but china considers taiwan to be its own territory just awaiting reunification so china naturally opposes recognition of taiwan as an independent state hence if a country goes too close to china establishes relation with china will naturally have to break ties with taiwan the solomon island was one among the six pacific states which had official bilateral relation with taiwan however in 2019 Solomon Island along with Kiribati switched allegiance to China. So now we have only four regional countries backing Taiwan and these four regional countries as i have told you are the micronesian group of islands. 
and they are under US control. So it's a kind of diplomatic victory for China in terms of the Taiwan factor getting into an agreement with Solomon Island. Apart from that, these smaller nations carry huge amount of power in, in terms of vote at the UN. They can become stock of good vote bank for mobilizing support at United Nations. And these Pacific Islands, they have disproportionately large maritime exclusive economic zone. And they are rich in resources. Particularly, Solomon Island has significant reserve of timber and mineral resources. And you know where minerals are. China goes there. China goes to Africa for this reason. China goes to moon for this reason. But most importantly, there is a strategic significance of this pact. Solomon Island has great strategic significance. And this was evident during World War II when Solomon Island was used as a base for Australia against the advancing Japanese. And the islands in the Pacific are strategically located for China to insert itself between America's military bases in the Pacific Islands and Australia. And this is specifically significant in the current scenario given the emergence of AUKUS. This alliance of Australia, UK and the US which seeks to elevate Australia's strategic capabilities vis-a-vis -vis China through the Anglo-American cooperation. This rather is seen as the immediate cause for China getting into agreement like this with the Solomon Island. The implication of this changing geopolitical configuration or effort to change it would be very wide ranging. The immediate concern that anyone will have in his or her mind is the dead trap that the Solomon Island would fall into. Chinese have promised flushing billions in the mega infrastructure projects. But we know what happened to Sri Lanka. You know very well what happened to Pakistan. And you also know very well what likely will happen to Nepal. Additionally, Solomon Islands, you see, sits on a critical shipping route. And if China will control Solomon Island through its dead diplomacy, that would mean China would potentially control the maritime traffic in and around the region. For the cause of free and open Pacific, all Pacific countries have a stake in protecting and stabilizing the security of the region. And to this cause, in 2018, Australia and the other Pacific Island Forum members, they signed Bo Declaration. This declaration clearly stated increasing Chinese strategic interest in the region. And the declaration talked about dealing with the regional security challenges collectively. But if the smaller island nations of the regions get heavily dependent on China, then the spirit of this declaration gets undermined. As you already know, the island nations of this region they comes under strong influence of US. Also, Australia and New Zealand exerts their strong influence in the region. Earlier, US also announced the plan to open an embassy in the Solomon Island. And they clearly said it. They said that it was a plan to increase its influence in the South Pacific nation before China becomes strongly embedded in the region. These island nations, they depend hugely on US, Australia, New Zealand. And this established power structure in the region is being increasingly challenged by China. Initially, it started with steady displacement of Taiwan influence in the region. Then China started with economic influence. And now cultivation of the political clout in the region. The geopolitics in the region is undergoing unprecedented change. ASEAN particularly is wary of this change. This great power rivalry in the region can make the situation volatile. And the Chinese influence in the Solomon Islands should be seen only as one piece of the larger global geopolitics. There is an article on page number 14 regarding man-animal conflict. Recently, many leopards, cheetahs and tigers, they have become the victim of man-made structures or they have been neutralized as a result of man-animal conflict. So we'll see this topic of man-animal conflict specific to tigers. See, first of all, the natural territorial requirement of tiger, especially the male tiger, is very high. It is around 60 to 100 square kilometer. But some of the tiger reserve, for example, the Boer Tiger Reserve in Maharashtra, has the total area of around 140 square kilometer only, which may be sufficient only for two tigers. Tigers actually move long distances. Going 1,000-1,200 km for a tiger in one season is very normal. Additionally, dominant tigers, the male tigers, they do not allow another tiger to enter into their territory. There is an old saying that there could be only one tiger in one hill. Because of this, wildlife experts estimate that around 29% of tigers in India are outside protected areas. Then on top of this, 
there are problem with regard to infrastructure projects the infrastructure projects the roadways railways even waterways they cut through the natural habitat of tigers for example the ken betwa river interlinking project will submerge around 100 square kilometer of panna tiger reserve yet another reason comes from our approach for protection of wildlife and specifically tigers we have adopted protected area approach but fragmented protected area actually does not work for animals that travel long distances like tigers like elephants and this approach pushes the wildlife to the brink of extinction we have seen an example very recently great indian buster despite being included in schedule 1 of wildlife protection act 1972 and despite having dedicated sanctuaries for protection of the bird the bird has gone to the brink of extinction because this closed protected area approach does not work for animals for birds that travel long distances this map here shows protected areas for tigers the area in purple that you see they are protected areas for tigers but as you can see they have been criss crossed by infrastructure projects especially the protected areas in central india they are fragmented so much by the development infrastructure projects that the corridors for the tigers to go from central india to eastern ghat have been destroyed and hence we are seeing increased number of man animal conflict or man tiger conflict in the state of telangana so what is the solution solution to any problem comes from understanding the root cause of problem and what is the root cause of problem here destruction of tiger corridors is the root cause so safeguarding the tiger corridors would be the most important solution then we must focus on building eco bridges telangana is also the first state to get eco friendly bridges especially for tigers that is being built over a canal that is cutting across tiger corridor linking tadoba and antheri tiger reserve a new technological solution has been adopted in the western ghat to reduce the man animal conflict for elephants elephant tracking collars have been given to elephants which are embedded by sms chips they automatically send text messages to nearby residents warning them of approaching elephants such measures can also be adopted for tigers we can also adopt co-concurrence approach or biosynthesism meaning man and animal can live in harmony if they do not impinge into each other's territorial need and that can happen with community participation one of the way to involve community is to give them rights to live near the protected areas and hence become active participant in conservation of animal and avoiding man animal conflict a more proactive approach is to give them benefits coming from protected areas as has been done in tadoba tiger reserve in maharashtra the money that come from tourism in the tiger reserve that is used for development of local villages around the tiger reserve in many african countries for example in kenya many innovative solutions have been tried and they work for example growing chilies around the agriculture land practicing bee cultures but it has mostly worked for elephants because elephants have very high cognitive memory if they have encountered some chilies in their path they will never come back to that area the article that has appeared in today's newspaper has come up with another solution of giving masks to the villagers and wearing them on the back of the head because you might know the fact that tigers love to attack the neck of human beings and that too from the back side this method saw huge success in sundarban it can be tried in other areas where there is high man tiger conflict there is an article on page number 11 regarding earth day you need to have some very general awareness regarding earth day for you every day on 22nd of april earth day is celebrated to raise public awareness about the environment and inspire people to save and protect it For the very first time, Earth Day was celebrated in 1970. This was started by a U.S. senator in the backdrop of huge oil spill in the year 1969. But globally, it was celebrated in 2009 when United Nations designated 22nd April as International Mother Earth Day. The concept of Earth Day recognizes a collective responsibility, as is called for in the 1992 Rio Declaration, famously called as the Earth Summit. 
the collective responsibility to promote harmony with nature and the earth to achieve a just balance among economic, social and environmental needs of present and future generations of humanity. And you must also know that the landmark Paris Agreement, this agreement was signed among 200 countries setting a common target to reduce global greenhouse gas emission on the Earth Day of 2016. There's another concept called as Earth R. Earth R is WWF, Worldwide Fund for Nature's annual initiative, and this began in 2007. And it is held every year on the last Saturday of March. It basically encourages people globally to switch off the lights from 8.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. as per their local time. In, in this article, there is also a quiz. There are seven general questions. For the purpose of exam, I would like you to attempt question number six. An average Earth day is 24 hours long, but it is increasing by about 1.7 milliseconds every century. What is the reason for the increase? Also attempt question number four. Globally, which economic sector emits the largest percentage of greenhouse emission at a whopping 